We are recording live from Levi's House of Strauss, myself, SK Vibe Maker. Um, on site podcast. Make sure you hit us up on the uh, on the socials at On Site Life, Twitter, Insta, subscribe, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, search on the YouTube, all of that stuff. And I don't like to sit down and be in a room by myself, having conversations by myself. So I like to have people in the building with me. Who's here today? It's Juice Menace. I'm here today. Cheese, a little slight, like a little slight accent and all of that. Yeah, well, you know, I'm Welsh in it. <laughs> Are you actually Welsh then? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, half Welsh, half West African, but born and bred in Wales. Yeah. Straight up, straight up. I mean, as a new artist, I always think that there is um, quite a big challenge making your mark in the game. Yeah. So for all the the new artists out there, like yourself. Talk to me about your journey in making your mark as a new artist. How hard or how easy it's been, the struggles, the hurdles. So I would say it's it's exciting, man. It is definitely exciting. I mean, I'm, I'm only young. I'm only just starting out. So everything I take, I take as an opportunity. That's just me, I think. But it's, it's scary at the same time. It's a little bit intimidating. Obviously, I come from like a small place. When you come to London, immediately you're dropped into this pool of loads of other talented people and loads of other people that know what to do and when to do. But I feel like we've talked about before that the fact that I'm not from London is like a strong point for me. Mm. It means that so I'm not sort of attached to this whole kind of like London sound thing. And it just, I think it allows me to be in my own lane and just do my own thing. Like people are not expecting me to sound like London or to produce something that can come from London because I'm not from London. So mm. I feel like I just, I get to do my own thing. So it's quite, it's quite exciting. Maybe the hardest part as a creative and artist of whatever sort you are, musician, producer, but let's keep it musician right now. Probably the hardest bit like, is actually making your mark, kicking down that initial wall, building yeah. the brand, making people know your name, Definitely. getting comfortable knowing about you. Is that something that you think about a lot? Yeah, I mean, I'm always, longevity is something that, it's something that I want. I don't want sort of like the viral for 30 seconds and then you've made enough money to feed your mum, but nobody cares about you. Mm -hmm. I want people to buy into me. I want to build something like for me, dropping songs is just the beginning like that. I, I see music as a portal to be, to open up so many other different business ventures. Cause in like, you see artists today, you start off as an artist before you know it, you're in films, then you've got your own brand, then you're working with this brand. Like I wanna work like I want my own shoes, I want my own fragrance, I want my own magazine, I want I want my I basically just put my name on everything in it. That's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do. But yeah, definitely starting off is difficult. I'm still very much in a position where I'm like finding my sound and sort of like testing out things, but I think it's a fun it's a fun period to be in because nothing's set in stone. I still very much get to toy around with everything, pick stuff up, drop it. But I feel like, yeah, I feel like it's really exciting. But it's it's difficult, but I try not to focus on that. I don't know, man. The sooner we realise that we are in the music business is maybe a powerful thing for us because, you know, in capital letters, business. Business, like, This yeah. is music business. There's a lot of, you know, branding, um, awareness that we need to make of, of whatever brand we're flaunting, whether yeah. it's us. Do you know what I'm saying? But it being the music business, man... Whether you're in it for the short haul or the long haul, I think it's very important to acknowledge music business. 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 That business. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Is yeah. that something that you think about a lot, like the actual business element of it? Because I think most successful artists, whether contrived or uncontrived, and I think like the contrived ones, it doesn't have to be like so bait and so like, um, you know, tear down another person. But yeah. it being music business, people got teams. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you have a person that you might understand, might not understand. They come from like, a, we're in a, the, the online viral generation at the moment. So Definitely. that in itself is business. <laughs> How much do you sit down with your team and think about the music business? Oh, all the time. I feel like our, our timeline changes constantly. We're always looking at the rest of the scene. We're always looking at what's happening and sort of like what moves can I make that will sort of put me put me there in the spotlight, but in my own spotlight. We're always looking at like challenges and things like that. Mm -hmm. What artists are dropping, what projects, what's in the top 40, what's go just what's going on in general. But yeah, we're always talking about the timeline. I feel like for me, creatively I have a, like a lot of say like I'm always talking about sort of like okay we've just done this what can we do next okay we've done that how do we move forward what's the next step I'm constantly looking at the next step always music business I feel like um it's more important to artists these days um, independent artists especially I would say from my point of view because we get to do a lot like ourselves you get what I'm saying we get to build our career you don't so much have to look for a label or a guy in a suit to help you these days you can go on google and you can do it all yourself so i feel like 
Well, my advice anyway to every artist would be be as heavily involved as you can in your business. Trust me, because you want to be the person that's on top of that. You don't want anybody else doing it for you. It's, it's tricky, man. It's like a it's like a line that you have to straddle because as a creative of whatever sorts, you want to concentrate on your creative. Yeah. And the more that you um, concentrate outside of your creative is the more that you become sidetracked and maybe dilute the powers of your creative. Yeah. So yeah, like yeah. obviously you want to be involved in the music side of things and you know what I mean the creative aspect of things rather than actually yeah. just creating the craft. Mm-hmm. But then that sort of that can, you know, divide your your attention, your 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 strength i guess so i would say personally i've never experienced that problem personally um i think it can get quite stressful though when you're dealing with admin and you're looking at sort of like the pen on paper the nine to five the corporate side of the music industry it can be very frustrating then to want to put yourself back into a creative mindset but for me music is me having fun music Mm -hmm. is my good time so when i'm done with admin and when i'm tired of talking about meetings or whatever stepping in the booth or listening to a beat that's that's my good time, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm. that's when it's time to wind down and just let my brain creatively flow. But yeah, it can be difficult, but I just think, you know, that's just, that's just cherry on top of the cake, isn't it? That's just something you gotta deal with. Juice Menace. It's <laughs> not your like regular type of name. That's not, is you it? You know what I'm it's saying? Not. Like, um, this is my first time meeting you today. <laughs> um, there's a lot of smiles happening. Um, yeah, I'm You know what I'm saying? Happy. Like, I mean, the name would suggest somebody who's quite fierce, Juice Menace, quite do you know fierce. what I'm saying? The hair swaggy today. Some people <laughs> can see the visual. Some people can't. It's blonde hair season. It's blonde hair season. I mean, how long have you had the blonde hair? Like a month. A month? Yeah. Do you know what's mad though? Like, for me, I feel like blonde hair is definitely juice. Because obviously that's not my government name, is it? But like, I feel like blonde hair is definitely me. I feel like I'm going to keep blonde hair for a while. I don't know. Blondes definitely have more fun. I've been having a great time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Talk to us about the name Juice Menace then. Because, you so. know... I'm a massive film head. I love films. Uh, Growing up, like, you put a film on, I'll sit there, I'll sit there for 10 hours watching films. My two favourite films is uh, Juice, you know, with Bishop, you Mm -hmm. know, see. So that, that's where Juice comes from. Yeah, with, and then uh, Menace to Society, Kane and Old Dog. Those films, they're not, uh, same genre kind of, I guess. They have a lot of similarities. I like those films because I always seen people doing stupid stuff when I was growing up. People glamorizing a life that wasn't for them and i feel like those two films especially there's no happy ending like mm. they literally tell you you go chasing a life that don't that ain't meant for you the karma it's lethal yeah so that's just see the blonde hair thing man there was a time that i can remember like um older women in my family black women and stuff the blonde hair was a real touchy thing like whether you was gonna have you know i mean women of color if you're gonna have blonde hair it's a real statement because obviously it's not natural so when you decide to go down that blonde hair route you're making a statement you could put yourself out there to be a target have you ever felt as you know i mean like i got this blonde hair man people are gonna want to say stuff but i'm rocking it I don't even hear nobody. Nobody saying that. And it don't make it to me. So that's that's your problem, isn't it? But yeah, I feel like the whole kind of for me, I've always had my natural hair like it is under you. Don't worry. So <laughs> putting blonde hair on, like I don't think it's a big deal in it. If you see me with curly hair, you see me with blonde hair, it's still me, in it. Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. I feel like let girls do what they want to do. You want to put a wig on, put a wig on. It's all right. We share the thing that we are. Um, we're definitely of mixed heritage. Yes. I mean, being of mixed heritage, you there's a lot of people that I know. That um, they have somewhat of um, an identity crisis, whether yeah. they want to acknowledge it or not. Yeah. Do I belong to the black side? Do I belong to the it's white deep. side? Does either side acknowledge or accept me? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Depending on it, I don't know if there's much of a difference whether your mum's black or your dad's black. Most of the time, it seems like um, the man is black and the woman is white. That seems to be yeah, that's the mix mine. the majority that's of the mine, time. Yeah. That's your mix. Yeah. Or you know what I mean? So like even with me, my dad Jamaican, my mum is the one of mixed heritage. I mean, what's your what's your actual mixed heritage? So my mum's family's English, but she grew up in Wales, um, so she's just white in it. And then my dad is from Liberia, so West Africa. Mm. And he came over to play football in the nineties. Straight. Uh yeah, he's playing he used to play for Southampton and he busted his knee in it and then he just I don't Retired. know. Retired. No, he didn't retire. Basically, he weren't trying to go back to the homeland, didn't it? So he just started impregnating bare people. Oh man, straight. So you've got loads of um. I yeah, mean, loads I mean, of it's, siblings. It's, it's a black man's plight, though. It happens. Yo, I think it's my mum. She don't think it's that funny. I think it's jokes. He was doing what he had to do, and he was just he didn't want to go home. Still. What? So you're saying your dad had children in the UK to stay here? Yeah. Mad. Yeah, he was just got to do what you got to do, innit? Yeah. <laughs> so back. <laughs> 
back to the mixed heritage thing yeah like <laughs> i mean have you found much of a identity crisis or, mm, uh, or like navigating your way through being a a human of mixed heritage a people that mixed aren't of mixed heritage don't understand it as yeah, much you know what i'm saying it's a it's it's um it's quite a taboo topic i feel like because you have obviously you're literally sat on the fence and it's, it can feel like when you go to either side of the fence f- to sort of like confide they don't really they're not really trying to listen that's just my experience for me i don't in my household and in my family that i sort of see my close family i'm a, i'm the only one of color everybody else is just white yeah so like family mm. photos i look a bit weird walking down the street it's like people forget that yeah i'm with them too so yeah growing up is just something i always had to deal with i think for a long time i seen it i did have a big chip on my shoulder I used to get into arguments with my mum talking about like, why don't I know about my heritage? And then she bought me a yam and I thought it was a pear. And do you get what I'm saying? So like, yeah, I think just growing up, it was sort of, it was something that I had to sit back and I had to think, if I want to be in touch with my roots, it's sort of like a journey of self-discovery that I have to take myself mm. on. I can't get it from my mum. It's, it's a bit lonely and maybe a it bit is unfair lonely. because, you know, yeah. my, as parents, parents are supposed to be there to guide and support their children so like i think the onus is probably on the parent to you know pass down the heritage she can't pass down a heritage that ain't hers though but not, not even the fact that i'm not i'm not even saying in your case though yeah. because like it gets complicated when there is um mixed relationships you yeah. know what i mean and like i feel like even if the relationship breaks down like say for example the the black parent goes which is the the father yeah. and the white parent is still bringing up their parent or their child of mixed heritage they have definitely an obligation to make sure that their child knows their heritage yeah. and knows where they come from and knows that side of them whether it's them doing research themselves to pass down yeah they have to do some type of research uh, yeah do you, do, do you feel like maybe your mum didn't do that for you I mean, to to an extent, yeah, that's what I mean. I did carry that chip on my shoulder for a long time because I just sort of, for me, it was sort of like, well, I don't know who I'm meant to go to to find out about these things. And then I was in um, my high school was like predominantly white. And it wasn't until I got to college and I started making sort of like more friends, you know, more black friends and stuff that I just, I would realise there were things that was missing, not necessarily missing things that I just didn't feel mm. as if I was a part of. And that again, you know, it can make you feel a bit, a bit dead or whatever. But at the end of the day, I think it's just coming to terms with, like I said, like now I've got older, I know my brothers, I know my siblings, I've got in touch with my family in Africa and stuff like that. So I'm building those connections and it feels good. But I think what I also had to sit down and say to myself was black's not a personality. It's just your heritage. It's not that deep, bro. Just Mm. be you in it. Mm. I think like a lot of the time with what I know from having mixed race friends and stuff, that identity crisis, you just you just have to brush it off. Like I said, it's techie. Yeah, it's techie, but it's not your you're you in it. You're not your skin color. It doesn't have to define you. Of course. like I mean, even through my plight, like um, I mean, like I said, my dad's Jamaican. My mum is um, Trini, you know, Caribbean, Ireland, just in case you yeah. don't know Trinidad, and Italian heritage. And it is a mix further back, you know what I'm saying? But I am more Caribbean than anything else, but I'm born here. Was that but the I, strongest influence? Like, in that your is, childhood, And it's the strongest though. influence of, like, my upbringing as yeah, well. Yeah, so, yeah, like, yeah. obviously that goes without saying. But I am mixed heritage, but I, I see myself as black. Yeah. But then, like, you know what I mean? There's mixed people. I don't know if you see yourself as black or you might see yourself closer to white. And I think that that is a part of mixed heritage um, humans that they have conflicts with yeah. and problems with in their life. Do you know I, what I'm saying? I've never... I don't think I've ever looked in the mirror and saw myself as a white guy. For me, obviously, being the only black person, it was made very obvious to me from a young age that, yeah, you're black. <laughs> just mm. to let you know in case you didn't realise. But, yeah, I've never sort of thought I was white. I would just, I I guess it's sort of, yeah, like where you grow up in it, the environment and sort of like how in touch you are. For me, it's swung the complete different way, though, because I grew up, but I just loved, I love things that necessarily people in my family didn't because I grew up in a different area. I grew up in like central Cardiff. So when I went to primary school, I'm sort of like my first primary socialization I was around a lot of different cultures a lot of different people so I loved that I didn't really know, know the difference it wasn't until I'd say my mum got with my stepdad now and then she had two other little kids and they were white and then their family came through and then that's when they sort of began to realize to me like oh one of these things is not like the others and that thing's you but like it's all right man I think it's kind of jokes now it even gets deeper though. Sometimes people are like, again, this is like a matter of opinion as well. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes people think because you're mixed race that you can't even say the N word as well. Gets techie like that as well. It people. does get techie like that, but mm, I know. I'm, let me not speak in it. Let me not speak. <laughs> <laughs> let me not say nothing in it. I would say nice though. 
each to their own in it i've said it my whole life yes well, i don't even say it that much to be honest and i don't love the word but I don't even question whether I can or can't say it. No, for me, I never did either. And that's purely because, like I said, within the own four walls of my own home, within sort of the safety of my family, between the ages of zero to six, I'd probably experienced more racism, prejudice and discrimination than most of my fully black friends. So mm. I feel like for somebody to come and tell me that I can't speak on black rights or that I shouldn't be able to say that word, you don't know how much I fought on behalf of the black community on my own in my white household so mm. you don't get to tell me ain't it mad kind of how you, you can have mixed heritage and then you have like um, a black side of your family that's got like their ways about them that feel a certain way and then you might have the white side of your family that are racist as well you yeah. know what I'm saying or yeah, like yeah, black yeah. you know everyone's got like I don't know how much you subscribe to this or if it's true but just through my experience you know people have got I, I'm more saying not racist parts but prejudices yeah and that's go that, that's obviously i mean if you come from like north london you're going to love north london more than you love south london yeah. and that's tribalism and the tribalism spreads into like race as well it doesn't mean that you hate the other side but you've got pre-judging going on prejudice yeah. and i always think that a person that's educated that is prejudiced or racist is the worst type you know what i'm saying someone who's prejudiced that has like a sheltered life is a whole next thing but like i said in families you could be of mixed heritage but then you've got like maybe the white side of your family that don't like you or they're racist, yeah. do you know what I'm saying? So Prejudice. From, prejudice, yeah. Mm. It's not, let's not call people racist. People get a bit scared of that word. It's like, don't be racist then, innit? But anyway, for me, my family is just, it's just white side, innit? They wasn't, like, they wasn't sort of like run back and forth. But I know my mum, when she was, um, obviously when she found out she was going to give birth to me and I'm the oldest, so I was her firstborn. Um, she was like the last of her siblings to have kids as well. So they, she she experienced a lot of prejudice. A lot of family members cut her off. Didn't want anything to do with her. Sort of like see me as a disgrace, whatever. But that's just people in it. Like I said, like for a long time, a very long time, I I sort of I kept that close to me. I sort of just you know thought it was my fault. You know why do why don't they like me? And then, and then I just got to the point where I was like, yo, I don't care. Mm. You're doing you, I'm doing me, and I'm doing better. Like it's just that in it. Like you want to be mad, go and do it in the corner. 